Adobe and pull everything up that way? Um, that was, yeah, that was what I was doing. Okay, let me see. Okay, so let's see. Share content. There we go. Share. See if I've got that much. Okay, that means I can upload. Yep, and are you able to put that in presentation mode or full screen mode or something? Yeah, isn't is that free? There yep. we go. That that looks better. Yep. Okay, so let me make sure I have all the rest of them loaded. Um, I mean, that's the fastest way to make sure we go quickly. Yep. Uh, and, uh, is it popping now into that? Yeah, okay. Yep. It'll, they'll have to just live with that while I get share slides. Um, and I think I'm flow specs first <clears throat> and I can't find it uh, there flow spec. And that way I can just go between these things. We'll be fast as we can. Okay. Now I don't have John. Do you have the next one? Is it um progress report is next what's after progress report could you just read it to me uh yeah let me just make my screen a little bit bigger here um it's a uh, idr bgp request cp srte policy okay and the next one after that uh idr ctr reliability Availability uh, or reliability? Uh, reliability is oh, it's showing up on here, uh, but the, the the deck is named BGP for Network High Availability. In fact, when okay, I, let yeah, me get in it's, on it's, the other, it's a, the it's other screen. Availability let me just, is correct. Okay. I'm going to pop up. I'm just getting the other one up and going. Ah, come on. Okay, let me pop it over to a few minutes. Okay, after high availability. Is it you that's on the Troy Miller or are we getting that audio from somewhere else? We are getting it from something else, I assure you. You might hear heavy breathing, but that's only because I'm uh, focused I'm gonna, on. I'm going to mute our call-in user if I can figure out how to do that. It's probably good for me now. Anyway. I can, I'll, I'll mute the call-in. Hold on. Uh, do we have one for the both of us or? Uh, hold on. I got to get back down out of it into participants. In order. They must have muted themselves. I also, I, I actually don't see how to mute another person. Oh. Which I would have thought I should have that ability, but I don't see it. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Now I'm muting myself. Yeah, and now I don't hear you. Oh, I see. Um, I see why I can't mute people is that uh, you are the host. I'm not the host. Okay. So I have to play mute, mute the people. Okay. Yes. Unless I do this reclaim host role thing. Shall I try that and we'll see if it, uh, um, 
That's okay. I've got, I, since I'm doing the presentation, I think I've got everything up and going. Um, I sent a note to Linda to suggest we delay hers till next next meeting. Okay. Do you hear anything back from her yet? No, but she was okay. waiting for me on something else. So okay. on this draft, so I think we'll be okay. Okay. It should allow us. Um, okay. My Jabber client. Um, my Jabber client is underneath this. So let me see if I can get my Jabber up here. Okay. I've got my Jabber in the corner. Can you see the Jabber or not? I see uh, a message from you that says, hi, John and Jeff. Actually, I don't see Jeff on right now. I just see you and me. Okay, I, it was just you. Okay. It, it, it may be that um, we don't get a lot of people on Jabber, which is fine too, but I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll keep it up on my screen and, and monitor it. Should I take it down? I'll take it down from this screen then, because that's what I guess I have is everything. If it's, uh, if, if, if your screen is too cluttered, I will, I will keep an eye on it. No problem. No, no. What is what is coming up on the screen for? Oh, um, yeah. What I see on the screen is I see the note well slide, but I see a gray box partly covering the upper left hand corner, which is maybe maybe uh, a jabber window. Yeah. Now it's is it just over where the gray gray area is now? Yes. Okay. Do you see the participants call list? Uh uh, all I, I mean, what you're projecting is I see note well, I see some tabs along the top. Um, I see the blue share button in the upper right, and I see some icons down the right, and I see the gray box on the left. That's it. Okay, so I've got everything to where I think we're good to go. Now all I got to do is get the, um, I got to get into the uh, second. I got to get into the um, minutes taking stuff. Either path. All oh, right. Yes, I should do that too. And I've got to get into the blue ether pad. I need like but, six computers to keep track of all this stuff. Well, and you wonder why we have a spare computer at the. Okay, so I got to sign in. To the blues. I saw that you sent out a request for volunteers. Um, did anybody say that they would take notes? I don't know that I sent out a request okay. for volunteers. I sent out a working group, but that's the first thing we should do is call for, you know, hi, please type. Right. Um, so that's since uh, other people are on and they're presumably listening to us right now. If uh, any of you would be willing to hop on the etherpad and help us uh, help us take notes, that'd be great. Um, we also have a blue sheet up. Um, they're both linked from the agenda. So feel free to start. Um, I just signed you in, John. <laughs> oh, cool. Thank you. We've got about two minutes and we're set to go. So um, I guess I should put up the interim meeting. Here's the topics. And we're gonna give it about, AC and everybody, we're gonna give it about five minutes just to, should we give it a couple minutes or go straight ahead, John? No, let's give it a few minutes. Um, I, I feel like we have, we're not, you know, so crowded that we have to do everything like right up to the minute and. Okay. Let's start at say five past the hour and. Okay. Why don't you put up the slide that has the, uh, the ether pad and the, uh, the blue sheet. Okay. Let's see if yeah. I've got it. Yeah, just... Here's. Etherpad and the blue sheet, folks. Oh, 
I see somebody started a virtual blue sheet tacked onto the bottom of the minutes etherpad too, which whatever we can cut and paste between them, that's fine. I've been known to cut and paste. I've just done that. <coughs> just a reminder to participants, um, please mute yourselves when you're not speaking. Can, uh, can I ask you guys just to drop those uh, links into the WebEx chat, please, for people good, to easily click on? That's Thanks. a good idea. I can do that. Okay. Oh, good. good morning. Hello. John, I've got to do the recording thing. Just a minute. Did you hit the recording or is it paused for me? Uh, I said it when, when I. Um, it's it's on. It's it looks like it says it's. Yeah, when I set the meeting up, I set it to um, record by default. So super. all of our chat at the beginning has been recorded as well. Okay, super. Okay. I'm going on mute until we get uh, two to three minutes forward. Folks, please sign in on the blue sheets. Uh, the blue sheets is virtual this time. And um, I just pasted the URLs into the uh, WebEx chat as per, I think it was Darren's suggestion. Folks, if you're a call-in user, would you please uh, type your name into the call-in user ID? That way we'll be able to take notes a little easier. Thank you. Hi, Sue. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, this is Jedo. I'm one of the call-in users uh, because I'm sometimes... Uh, Audio from the computer is not that good. Okay, yeah. Okay. Hey, Sue, so Jay was um, calling user three. And he just disappeared. And you got a name. Sorry. Do you do, do you want me to do the chair slide and then go into? Yeah, let's go ahead and and project those. I guess we should get going. Okay. Give me a second while I, something seems to be amiss. Uh, there we go. No.
Okay, folks, uh, it's about four minutes after. Please, everyone who's online, uh, we're recording this, but it'd be really handy if you'd please type your name into the blue sheets. Uh, that's uh, part of the request. We are under the note well. Uh, we did project that earlier, but I will re-show it. Uh, this proceeding is part of ITF. Uh, read the note well. We suspect you've done it. If you have any questions, read the note well on the uh, interim web page. So our 2020 IDR, we're going to have two um, present two slots pre-assigned. This one in April 8th. If we need another one, we'll go ahead and uh, ask for one immediately after everyone else, probably next to our friends in LSR. Um, last I checked, that was close to the end of the month. Is that right, AC? Your last LSR session? Okay, he must be on mute. Okay, let's go right into the next thing, which is the flow spec discussion. Our first two presentations, the flow spec and the auto configuration, are more discussion, discussions. So please, folks, I'm going to start with the discussion, but we need your feedback. Uh, the auto design configuration design team G will give us summarization, and the rest of the auto de uh, configuration design team will probably add comments. It's a discussion moment on where they are. Then we'll go into 60 minutes of draft presentations. Hopefully that'll keep us awake for the folks on the West Coast. Okay. So. So, hey, Sue. Yep. Um, before, um, let, let, let's just talk through the logistics for people who joined later and didn't okay. uh, view those yet or whatever. So, um, if, I'm not sure if anybody's hopped in the etherpad yet to help us take notes. Um, you know, this is being recorded, of course, so it's and and there's no scope for side chatter that can't be picked up on the recording. So that's maybe slightly kinder to the chairs, but even kinder to the chairs than that would be if you help us uh, produce the notes in real time. That would be great. Thank you. Um, if you haven't signed the blue sheets yet, please do. I will. Uh, repaste those URLs into the WebEx chat in just a second. Um, so we're hoping to use uh, for mic line management um, the same protocol that was used during the official IETF 107 sessions, which is uh, please put a plus Q into the chat and wait to be recognized. Um, and, you know, just like you would at the regular Mike Line, please uh, state your name. And um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, we have uh, Jabber if you need to do other side chat. Um, and uh, I had one other slide, Sue, with uh, just like a couple of administrative things. Um, yep, let me get to it. There we go. Uh, slide is slightly old, but that's okay. Um, so the, the, the two administrative things that I wanted to mention, one of which is on the slide that's being projected or was going to be projected is, um, that, uh, the author is on the BGP open policy draft of requested working group last call. Um, so we will start that shortly. Um, the other thing was there was a, a request. Um, a few days back, or maybe about a week back from, um, I think it was TCPM to say, please, uh, put your eyes on the, you know, their working group last call. That, um, request is on the, on, on our mailing list, but, um, you know, I just wanted to highlight it. Okay. That's it for me. John, let me know if I, if I'm missing something in the chat line. Yeah, I will. Okay, folks. I'm monitoring the, um, uh, the Jabber room and stuff, and I'll break in if I need to. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. This is a discussion about BGP flow spec. 
I went back and looked at the first time I suggested a V2 at an interim, and that was June 27, 2016. So life has gone on. Um, we've gotten here through about four years. We decided to do a quick 5575 BIS. That didn't turn out so quick. Uh, and we have a really good up and coming. So it's a kickoff for an informed call for presentations on April 8th. Uh, for the next IDR session, I'm going to sort of walk through what we've done, where we're going, and then we need some discussions. So we set requirements. And then my last question of this presentation is, do we need other discussions? Do we need to have, before we get there, an IDR uh, large community discussion in case we have to talk about wide communities large communities. Both of them have been just on the list. So, close spec review. You should remember that we had the NRI, uh, we had uh, V6 coming in, uh, no user-based filters, and we thought about security, okay? And could it be lessened within a single draft? That went back all the way to 2016 Here's our standard flow spec policy. It's a rule list followed by the rule, followed by match filters, followed by um, modify and forward. That should have been mom and apple pie. The RFC 5575 BIS fixes uh, fix the LRI, replacing the encoding, the opaque key with an encoding, divine uh, new comparison bits. Uh, and uh, matches had uh, traffic filtering extensions and added traffic rate. The security section was updated, but that didn't change anything except the words and warnings. And we have a draft IDR flow spec V6, which we need for the ISG to consider 5575 BIS, or they strongly recommended they'd like to see it. But we've had no working group last call uh, comments or um, work. John and I will need to say it's going forward, but the draft is under my author, under Chris uh, Christoph, first authorship, and Robert and I. So please make some sort of uh, comments on the list really do need to push this forward and through. So Whoever please. is typing with their microphone on, please stop it. Robert Better. or Colin user, hi. Um, feel free to add any comments as I go through some of this. Uh, call in user four. If you're calling user four, please make sure your mic's off. Okay. So what, what do we have as well? Um, besides begging and pleading that I need some comments on the V6 spec, here's the mature specifications and here's part of what I need to hear from the operators. Notice back in 2016, the draft IDR BGP flow spec OID was there because it allowed a ASs to, uh, such as uh, ATs, one usage, to use centralized flow spec filtering without making the flow spec filtering go through a sink through the box. Um, we had a list discussion about. Problems putting that in 5575 bis. We need to have a little bit discussion because this is one of the things where people say they already have deployed it. Why can't I have this uh, pushed on to 5575 bis? And the list seems to say too many broken things. So I'd like to pick that one up. The second one is uh, there are several additions to the flow spec either adding tunnel filters for flow spec and VO3, adding L2 VPN filters, or extending the RT consideration for a group identifier for interfaces 
or having the path redirect. Most of these have either gone through some implementation or implementation and deployment. So we've got to sort of say, what are we going to do with this? If Are we going to go on to flow spec NG? Uh, next generation was the next politest thing I could say. Are we going to pick some of these and say, oh no, to our AD, these must go in. The less uh, adopted but ma less mature are uh, flow spec uh, match for MPLS and label. That seemed to be hot and then maybe with S uh, MPLS SR it became less. There's an adoption request for draft Lee IDR flow spec and a couple more in the um, churning uh, situations, uh, draft Wang flow spec dip origin AS filter and draft Lu IDR flow spec IFIT. All of these have been put on hold while we try to force the 5575 this into ITF last call. It's there. One other thing, um, there is a draft already using the wide community atoms that was uh, what I had originally proposed, and I'm going to come back to my questions, uh, to use some sort of sub-TLVs ordering, because that's what's really, uh, there's no ordering or uh, sequencing of the filters. It's all of them are turned on and that's what you put in. If you wanted to have some ordering to say, this is the priority first, then this is the second or some sort of weighting, you need a new, some sort of TLV with some sort of length, with something there to make sure we know what's happening. And one way to put it was to put a new action atom for wide communities and put some things in. Notice there are some people using wide communities. Another option is um, putting a f uh, atom directly in wide communities, using that as the only one putting a source number AS and a list of atoms. Those are all things that we've talked about in the past. I've now done my review and here's our question. And uh, at this point, we're going to take notes as best I can. Uh, maybe G, you could help me with this one and I'll do the uh, design spec on the next one. Uh, if you can type, if not, folks, we'll try to pick it up. Do operators okay, need for flow spec? Thank you, G. Uh, what do operators need now for flow specification? At which point I need to hear from folks who are deploying or working with folks who are deploying. What do you have to have now? Sue, do you want to read your whole slide or do you want to take questions now? Um, I want to take question. The, I'm assuming people can read, but I'd like to go through the questions one at a time. Okay, uh, so you have somebody in the mic line. Uh, Jeff is in the mic line. Yes, Jeff, go ahead. Quick mic check. Yep. Thank you. So, unfortunately, you're, you're barreling through a, a whole bunch of interrelated topics, so that's making it uh, difficult to respond to them individually. Uh, what you're sort of hitting at the beginning of your slide deck really is uh, where we're at, where we have some number of things that mature, so like 5575 bis is about the pop. That's great. V, flow spec V6 basically is do 5575 in V6. So that should be easy. OID is well deployed. That should be easy, et cetera. So a, a lot of these things are just simply cleaning up stuff that uh, has some level of implementation. That's great. So uh... the, 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 re the related point, unfortunately, is once we get past anything that involves changing the NLRI, the actions are one thing, but changing the NLRI, one of the things that has, you know, became very apparent as we were doing the 5575, this stuff, is that implementations are intolerant of, you know, the original specification of so-called opaque stuff, mostly because the TLV format did not actually support uh, type length in each of the cases, which made it impossible for us to parse things that we didn't understand. You would move to your slide covering the flow spec v2 stuff or mg uh, 
it's not so much that people are looking for the sub TLVs to actually have precedence ordered. The issue that people have since flow spec, this is the slide. The, the issue is that uh, since flow spec represents firewall rules, and firewall rules are groupings of, you know, apply this set of thing in this order, it's less that an individual sub TLV which matches a component type as a precedence. It's the fact that a rule that represent, is represented by a set of uh, matches as a precedence. So basically, the order would bubble out one level. Jeff, I, you're right. I probably did mix everything, and my questions were meant to uh, split it down into what should be deployed first. So, can we pick up the ordering if you think it can? Uh, into what specifications can be adopted with the current 5575 bits, which you mentioned first. Could right. And that thread. Right. And just to finish off my comments, is, this is going to be the broad set of comments I would give through the set of presentations. Okay. Is, is we have some things that probably can be done you know, quite easily just simply by doing a flow spec V2 that allows for strict you know, TLV definitions of NLRI. You know, that, that's, I think, the core basis of what we need to proceed for 5575 BIS. If we allow for rule ordering, I think there's going to be some interesting debate on there, and uh, that's going to be a, a tricky thing. And I think the final item that will be somewhat tricky is uh, the incremental deployment considerations. One of the things that uh, sort of became apparent across the full set of feature recommendations that we have is once we start getting into things that uh, start crossing boundaries. So, for example, there was a proposal that allowed for uh, the FIB to take programming from flow spec at the same time as uh, the firewall rules take that programming. We start crossing how rule ordering can actually happen. And in some of those cases, the, the fix for it may be keep the same encoding, but potentially different AFIs have. It. So I, I think that's the three broad set of things. The rest of it is just mostly, I think, squishing things down in the same app. And then the last bits of fallout as you're having on your slides is for our various actions. How do we want to handle encoding of those? And there are several different proposals. Thank you. Okay, I have a question because it was on the list. Somewhat I thought from you is let's go back to our friend um, OID. Can OIB, uh, what I heard you say is that OID could be done with a better uh, definition of the NLRI. Or did I hear you say it could be done with the current 50, uh, RFC 5575 BIS? Which so one of those ones? So the 55 uh, OID could be shipped. Uh, OID specifically impacts the validation rules of how FlowSpec gets deployed. And I know that Christoph and company had uh, some debate as to whether we should simply fold in the OID specification into 5575 BIS. And I believe the consensus at the time was to not do that. Uh, the Motivation, I believe Christoph uh, cited was that this is a misdocument and therefore we're cleaning up things that are uh, erroneous out of it rather than trying to pull in uh, different proposals. That said, I, uh, every flow spec that I'm familiar with does the OID things because it's the necessary work to originate this stuff from a route reflector. So so that, that, doc that document's an interesting place of you could publish it as a RFC that basically is an immediate and very common modification to 5575, or the working group could decide to fold it back into 5575 BIS. Since 5575 is in last working ITF last call, I think that one's well. That that that'll be an interesting discussion. And I um, think, and I think that was where it was left in. Uh, we're just going to proceed basically with immediate modification to the base. Okay. Um, any other comments on OID? Contrary to Jeff, thoughts on the same thing, concerns? Hi, Sue. This is Jim, Jimmy Taro. Can you hear me? Mm hmm. So, 
So I was one of the folks that um, felt that OID, widely deployed, widely used, um, is one of the biggest use cases for ProSpec, and it should be folded into the general um, document itself. Instead of having two parallel documents um, that, you know, sort of juxtaposed against each other. I still feel that way. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm going to relay a comment that Robert made on Jabber, and he said, just reiterate Jeff's comment, changing NLRI format without new capabilities or new SAFI just does not go that well with any AFI SAFI, not just flow spec. Meaning this isn't a problem specific to flow spec. It's, it's a broader problem. So at least that's how I read it. I'm editorializing now. Anyone else? So what I'm hearing is most people say we should have gone ahead and put OID in with the um, in with the fifty five seventy five bis. Oh, go ahead. Alex, this should use the push cube. Uh, it's worth pointing out that we're already in the process of discussing. So, publish as is, get the V2. Okay, is, is the next one. Yeah, that, okay. This is John I was, with, with my co-chair hat on. Just, just to remind everybody, this that was kind of the plan from the get-go was, you know, um, unfortunately sort of best laid plans of, of mice and men, but um, the idea was to get the, uh, the BIS out quote, fast, unquote, so that we could then turn around and do any protocol changes in V2, which was itself not intended to be, you know, massive um, new protocol. It was intended to be, let's now take the, uh, you know, any non-backward compatible changes we need to make and, and roll them in. Okay. Um, folks, the other things that have uh, flow spec NVO3, which is, and switch to do tunnel filters, probably the better uh, way to do that. L2 VPN flow spec interface path redirect. Does that all go sort of into the, let's have a, the second category Jeff listed, which is a better TLV definition? Path redirect is in the class of redirect actions rather than uh, matching NLRI. So it's not impacted by the need for a flow spec. Um, so path redirect not, is effectively it, the same thing as like redirect IP or redirect yeah. or if that's part of the core spec. So it doesn't require uh, NLRI changes. Um, I'll, I'll make sure that other people feel the same way, Jeff. I'm only, th these top, th this is coming up because I had some notes. I want to make sure I've at least raised it. And Jeff, I think that you should make sure that um, your, the, the minutes properly reflect what, what your point is, you know, when we get around to polishing up the minutes. Yes. Um, Okay, um, some people said that uh, the action in uh, IDR flow spec path redirect uh, needed some sense of order. Is that true? Not true. Jeff doesn't believe it's true. I'm, I'm asking for feedback. I know it's early in the morning, folks. I thought talking would help. The 
path redirect does have within the redirections itself in the communities a form of ordering. Mm -hmm. There, there was discussion on the fact that uh, doing those sorts of things with communities is dangerous, considering that they could just be added or dropped by things in the middle of the network. They're not part of the NLRI. But uh, that's that's a distinct point from low spec itself needing uh, the NLRI needing a uh, ordering. I agree. It is the it is the ordering. Yes, they are two different things, and I should have been more careful in my question, Jeff. Thank you for the correct the uh, clarification. So, folks, um, at this point, we're going to go with the next round of flow specs: NVO three, L two VPN, R two uh, interface. With going to the better LRI, um, the interface looks to redefine the art, uh, route target and the group identifier. Does that need anything different than the NLRI? So jumping the mic again, as one of the authors of that spec, we did actually discuss whether or not that belonged in the NLRI and one of the motivations for an extended community ended up being the fact that uh, it was so difficult to change the NLRI and have it be transitively deployed. Uh, but that said, we actually talked ourselves into a different story over the course of the document. Uh, we're, we're actually past due sending the update to the document. Uh, what we figured out over the course of the development work is that unlike uh, most match criteria that we have in flow spec, despite the fact that this is effectively a match criteria. This is a match criteria that may actually uh, need to change uh, or even be deleted when you cross various boundaries. So as an example, interface scoping means something in a given domain. This is one of the usual BGP problems of we don't really have good namespacing on some of our elements. So if, you know, ASFU, you know, it has interface ID uh, scoped as 100 being customers. Once you leave AS100, it stops meaning that. So, mm -hmm. so that's a case where when it crosses an ASBR, it may actually make sense to delete that. However, if it was encoded in NLRI, we have sort of longstanding Windows wisdom that changing NLRI on a hot by hot basis can be dangerous because you could end up with sort of like uh, packet copy machines where you know, things are just sort of constantly changing back and forth in a metastable fashion. So we decided that despite the fact that it's a match criteria, since it is intended to be modified rather than reoriginated, it should stay. Okay. And again, you have part of the questions if communities can be uh, deleted, does that give you a problem within? A confederation uh, within a single management domain, which could be confederations, a single AS, uh, a span of ASs under a single uh, entity. Uh, it should be fine. Uh, this the operative word being should be should be, and it's uh, in exactly the same space of should be as a L3 VPN operator needing to be careful about not overloading too many route targets into a L3 VPN and all right. Okay, so we have we have the uh, NLRI changes for NVL three L two VPN. We have uh, community changes uh, within a domain for a flow spec interface, and we have ordering questions on flow spec path redirect. All of which have seen deployment. Sounds, um, it still sounds like we should do the NLRI fix uh, to put in the flow spec interface. Is that true? Because then there's the clear ordering or not, Jeff? Uh, we should not. Um, basically, to, to go back to one of Robert's comments about the dangers of changing NLRI, uh, usually needing a new AFI SAFI. We don't want an element that's intended to be rewritten at going inside of an LRI. I'm sorry, different question. I was unclear. 
do we need to go to the uh, revision two of flow spec with the better NLRI to deploy uh, draft IDR flow spec interface? No, we're seeing good deployment of that right now. And uh, I'm aware of at least one implementation, uh, which is not having any issues. And uh, my employer is in the process of coding it up as well. Okay. Any, Jim, uh, Yataro, any comments on that? A anyone else who's deployed uh, flow spec interface? No comments. So that's Jimmy Tower, at t No comment. Okay. Any other operator that wants to provide me comments? Okay, we'll take private comments. That would be fine. Uh, the chairs are really trying to figure out where we draw the line. What I've heard right now is uh, flow spec interface and flow spec OID with flow spec OID coming as fast as humanly possible. Um, I believe um, the OID Jim has been uh, reviewed by Christoph. It's been reviewed by me. We'll, we'll uh, work on that. Then the interface, the next two, the NLRI, the flow spec NVO3 and L2 VPN toward the next uh, revision. And I still uh, have not heard any uh, questions to resolve the flow spec ordering issues. So I would like to ha have a conversation um, with the flow spec redirect authors and make sure we've gotten through that. Um, just a minute, I've got to close something. Uh, I guess I can't. Okay, the rest of these uh, would absolutely need to be deployed inside of a flow spec NLRI uh, better idea. Is there any uh, comments on authors from that where they would have differing of that? I think I must, that's my default as, as uh, trying to sort through these. Okay, last but not least, do we have any dependencies? Um, do we need to pick up the large communities discussion before we pick up the NLRI discussion or more extended work? Uh, Jeff is in the mic line again. I think Jeff can go ahead. Thank you, John. Um, so I want to say one thing general about large communities, and this applies to a lot of things that are going around IETF right now. For reasons uh, some people didn't agree with at the time, the original authors for large communities decided to not leave any uh, distinguished number space for them. Mm -hmm. The main problem that we have for large communities is uh, exactly that problem. And it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what we're going to use it for. We're at a point where people are going to want to start carving out uh, sort of like the equivalent of 1997 well known communities. We just need to pick a number and assign it and live with the fact that uh, the feature is young enough that hopefully some operator somewhere isn't using that magic number. Okay. Um, I, I have what I have. I'm, we're going to assume deprecated AS sets and confed sets as I haven't seen anything other than people telling me uh, steps in the refinement. Okay, I've gone my time uh, on this, uh, maybe a little long, Jeff. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? So I will be contacting all the authors. Um, on this uh, minus the OID uh, for uh, a quick status update. The OID, I think we're pretty good. Jim, as far as I know, it's a pretty well done deal. Do you want to, you and any of the co-authors uh, that you know of want to provide any feedback on deployment at the next, at the next IDR meeting? 
because I will start another working group last call. Sue, this is Jimmy Tower, ATT. I will check with um, my internal folks to see what they would like to share or would not like to share. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Um, I would suggest that we're going rapidly into a working group last call for that. Please, again, please, please uh, respond to the V6. John and I will have to push that one forward to the ISG. We'd rather have your feedback. And I would like to relay a couple of comments that were in the WebEx chat, um, just to make them part of the main conversation here. Uh, so, Doug Snyder says, question, what does flow spec have to do with large communities, or am I confused about the topic at hand? Jeff Haas replies, Job, people want to encode actions in them. Job Snyder very cogently says, ugh. Randy Bush <laughs> says, <laughs> Randy Bush says, Job, well said. Okay. <laughs> that, uh, 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 the chair can't say oof, ugh. So thank you very much, Joe and Andy. Uh, so, okay. Hey, Sue? Yeah. Stacey. Hey, I, I, did, I, I see the offer. Some of the offers are on the phone, but there is a, uh, a non working group draft for uh, known communities, uh, for well known. In, in regards to uh, Jeff's final comment. There's a short draft on space for large community well-known well -known communities. Thank you. I'll take a look at that and query the authors. Are you one you of have, the authors? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, it's Jacob. Yeah, I'm, I'm an author of uh, well-known large communities um, and I've uh, I've uh, got time to um, uh, present that next week. Yep, that's what I had hoped. Okay, thank you. Uh, so one more person in the line um, is Randy. Please go ahead. Um, I'll put in the uh, etherpad a reference to um, our paper, which is why Job said, oh, and I seconded him, which is essentially major Encoding actions in a community is a major attack vector. <clears throat> Thank you, Randy. Yes, we'll come back to you uh, on uh, the 8th along with flow specs. Okay, I think I've had enough fun for today. Gee, it's your turn. <laughs> I'm now turning this over to G and taking up the uh, 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 trading places with him on the uh, Etherpad. John is the going to watch the mic list. G, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. And I'll move the slides. Just tell me next. Okay, okay. Thank you. So uh, this is a progress report from the DGT Autocom design team. I'm presenting here on behalf of the, all the design team members. Next slide, please. Okay, so basically, this is a quoted from John's email to the working group. The purpose of the design team is to firstly, to identify the requirements and also to do some solution space review, and which can be used to guide our further discussion in the working group to produce a solution. So our goal is now to give a specific uh, solution from the design team, although that which is not forbidden from the uh, chair's mail mails. Okay, next slide. Oh, this is the members of our design team. I would like to thank all for this uh, discussion and contribution to this design team. Okay, next slide. Tony P, would you kindly mute your mic if you're going to type? Not okay. your problem, G. Someone else was typing and making noise. John just told him to. 
Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So this is how it worked uh, in the last uh, two months. Uh, basically, we had uh, most of our discussion happened on the mail list, and the people can check the mail archives for the design team. And in addition, we also held uh, one conference call to speed up the discussion, and the minutes can be found on the ESA pad. Um, apparently, we face some difficulty in uh, collecting all the team members at the one time slot. So the conference call was not uh, used as a very frequently tool for the discussion. We prefer to use the uh, mail list. Okay, next slide. Okay, the first uh, thing we did in the design team is to identify the scope. And we have agreed to work on the data center case first in the design team. And more precisely, it is about when BGP is used as the underlay routing protocol in the data center. At the same time, we will also consider the difference, difference between the uh, the center case and the other cases like the WAN or IXP case. Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, the most important thing we did in the last two months is about uh, the requirements. Uh, we want to identify a small, a minimal set of uh, common requirements. Uh, based on the existing proposals and based on the design team discussion. And here are the common uh, requirements we got. Uh, we can check uh, briefly. Uh, first is uh, we need to support uh, different address families like IPv4 or IPv6 for the um, HP session. And second, uh, we need to support both uh, using the direct interface uh, address or the loopback address for the HP session setup. And the third thing is uh, so we need to discover some necessary uh, uh, information for the peers um, session setup, like the IP address of the peers and the AS numbers. Uh, and then we want to have some authentication to be uh, enabled for the BGP protocol messages. The last is uh, this uh, uh, conf should be able to enable some live disk, uh, liveness disk detection mechanism such as BFD. So we can see the common ones are relatively short. We agreed on this uh, small set, and we will see the other requirements we discussed in the design team in the following slides. Okay, next page. Okay, this is one uh, requirement we discussed, we are still under, which is still under discussion in the design team, uh, which is uh, the capability of communicating arbitrary attributes to peers according to the operator's needs. Uh, this is, a, I think, the general capability which should be only uh, used between the BGP peers and it will not be propagated further to other nodes in the network. Um, basically, the design team think this kind of capability uh, useful, but there's still some discussion about uh, two points in the design team. The first is uh, whether it should be uh, part of the BGP autoconf procedure or it should be done uh, in BGP itself, which means it can be this kind of information may be exchanged after the BGP session is established. Uh, the second uh, uh, thing is uh, whether it should be a generic capability for operators' customization, and so that we don't need to, if uh, any uh, encoding or any well-known IDs uh, in ITF. This is supposedly for the custom uh, for the operator to customize its meanings and its value. Another option is we may introduce some guidance or structures to this kind of uh, attribute. Uh, so this is, can be part of the design for this kind of attribute. Okay, uh, next page.
Next slide. Can you hear me? G, you have the list of other suggested features up. Is that what you see? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, I think my network is not that good. Uh, okay. Can you go back to the previous one? The requirements uh, collected? Is oh, the ne okay, next page. Thank you. Okay. List of other suggested features, number one. That's yes, what's yes. going. Yeah, it's marked slide number eight. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's why it's, this one is good. So the, in this page, at the next one, we list uh, some uh, features suggested in some existing proposals, uh, but they are not uh, adopted yet in from the design team. I think uh, they may be reviewed later, or some of the some of them can be considered further whether they will be added into the minimal common set of requirements or some one may be optional but is still useful uh, requirements. Okay, we can go to the next page. I mean, no, not to read re this one by one. You are on a uh, list of other suggested features too. Yeah. Yeah, this is another set of the suggested features we collected from existing proposals. Okay, we can go to the next page. Uh, okay, this one is about some design principles of this uh, BGP, BGP auto configuration mechanism. Make sure you may need some further discussion in the working group, like uh, we got some uh, feedbacks from the design team members about the design principles, which are listed in this page. The first is uh, someone uh, prefers to have this mechanism independent from the BGP session establishment. Well, some others think uh, this mechanism should not uh, change the BGP session establishment or routing exchange, but uh, it may have some interactions for the figuring of the setup or removal of the peer session based on the uh, BGP uh, peer auto discovery mechanism. Some people think uh, we need the mechanism generic for any link layer protocol. Uh, and uh, another thing is whether we should uh, make use of uh, existing or uh, uh, widely implemented or deployed uh, protocol so as we can reduce the cost and the complexity. Or we can has, uh, have defined a relatively new protocol but widely apl applicable to not only BGC but also uh, other routing protocols which need this, the layer 3 discovery. Uh, another thing we need to consider is about the message uh, size because uh, I think we had some discussion before in the in working group about whether uh, if we have uh, some particular uh, attributes added to a message maybe the size can be bigger and then a, for some kind of protocols, it can be an issue or whether how can we deal with that. There's some extensions. Uh, also, we require some coordination with other SDOs. Yeah, so this, I think uh, for this uh, design principles, we need some further discussion in the working group in the wider uh, So, uh, before we go on, Gee, before you go on, do you want to ask any questions or take any feedback on this, or do you want this to be an yeah, email yeah. list uh, discussion? Um, maybe you can finish the slides first, or okay, we'll go to the rest of the slides and come back. Yeah, if anybody wants to break in, they can add themselves to the 
queue, of course, but otherwise just please continue, I think. Okay, so this page, we list uh, the existing proposals we reviewed and uh, discussed in the design team. And there are four drafts which are mainly about the discovery in the data center. Well, the last one is uh, uh, merged from two other drafts, and it is uh, mainly about the BGP auto discovery in the one or XP scenarios. So it is uh, currently it is not uh, listed in the analysis in on the next page. Okay, we can go to the next one. Okay, this is uh, some brief analysis of, to the existing proposals, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Warren for his review, and based on his review, I had some more information about the functions of each uh, proposal. Um, in this uh, table, I list uh, the design principle of each draft, the basic functions it provided, and some consideration about the extensibility for the additional attributes, and also the concerns uh, uh, we discussed on the design team list. Okay, um, I think from the design principle, this one is uh, very important. We can see different drafts propose different mechanisms, either based on existing uh, layer two protocols or based on new layer two protocols or some new messages for BGP or we use some existing BGP messages. And this can impact the extensibility of this mechanism. And for the functional functionalities, I think some of the drafts you can see that they, uh, provide a large, a long list of the capability uh, functions and then attributes. Okay, and for the concerns, I think for the LDP draft, the major concern is about the length limitation and the, its progress of the V2 in IEEE. And for the L3D L U R P C draft, uh, there's a, some there's some concern about why this will uh, dependency on the support of the layer three D L. And there's a, a session based mechanism. Maybe this is a, some more details we need to discuss further in the in group. And for the draft issue, there are some concerns about its uh, change to the BGP mechanism and the state machines introduced. The last one, the draft Razuk, uh, I think I think this draft is uh, introduced very small changes to the BGP, and uh, consequently the solution is uh, not quite. Uh, uh, complete and uh, the scale of extensibility is relatively limited. There's a question in the queue. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, we I think we we almost finished. Okay, uh, you want to? Um, okay. do, do you want to take the question in the queue now, or hold to the uh, until you finished your last slide? Okay, we can take it now. It's also okay. Okay. Please go ahead then. Okay. Robin? Uh, uh, Jamie, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, so I, I can want, hear. Okay, so I want to know that the, uh, the second one, uh, the third one, I mean, so that's the BGP message based on UDP, and uh, uh, the first one is the reuse BGP open message with the new UDP port. I want to know uh, what's the 
difference. I mean so that the for the third one I still use the some of the existing UDP port. Is that right? Uh, because it's changed to UDP, uh, I think the port number need to be assigned. I know also that the different major difference is um, the third one and it uh, defines a new BGP message format and is more extensible, it can introduce many additional uh, TLVs. Well, the last one is to reuse existing BGP open message format so that they can introduce uh, smaller changes. Uh, the cost, uh, uh, the cost is uh, uh, cannot be that extensible. Maybe you can use the existing BGP open uh, optional parameters to introduce some new attributes, but it's not that uh, flexible or extensible as the third one. Mm. Okay, I see. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. Yes, I have no other question. Okay. Hi, Sue. Sue, next slide, please. Okay. For the next steps, uh, here's the things we want to do for the next steps. The first is, uh, as I mentioned, we want to confirm the minimal set of common requirements based on the uh, list of the common requirements we show in the slides and based on the further discussion about the other requirements. And the second thing is we want to raise some consensus on the design principles. And then based on this, based on this we probably could put these uh, requirements and the design principle into a one requirement document. Then I think the job of the design team will be done and we can hand this uh, the next step solution discussion to the working group. We can uh, invite more people to join the discussion here. Okay. There's Je Jeff is in the That's mic all. queue. This is Jeff. So I think one other thing that didn't quite make it out of our discussion in the design team uh, that's somewhat relevant is where some of the attributes you know, for these protocols come from. Uh, we, we sort of left it as a, it has to be figured out and we have to decide if that's an important thing as part of the auto configuration itself. So as examples, interface uh, address configuration some of the proposals that use things like IPv6 link locals obviously don't require coordination. Uh, things that happen over some form of global address uh, would. Uh, so that means that may need to interact with things like DHCP. Uh, the same thing is true for like AS number discovery. Is that something that is provisioned or not? And depending on exactly which you know, solution space you're targeting for things like data center, those things can vary. Um, eventually, some of them end up being uh, driven strongly by provisioning. That's my comment. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Okay, and then we have Robin next. Uh, to me, Huawei, I want to, I have a doubt on the page eight. So can you go to the page eight? Okay, I think this is uh, nine, 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 page nine. Oh, uh, eight. Sorry. Uh, here. Okay, Jamie. Uh, so here mentioned is the provide layer two keep alive message for ascension continu continuity. Uh, I'm a little, uh, uh, I'm a little confused about this one. Why is layer two? instead of a layer three. Okay, okay. 
I see. This is uh, actually this uh, requirement is collected from the existing draft ministry DL, which is a uh, more generic, and uh, the ministry uh, neighbor discovery is just a one uh, specific feature of it. So this is a more generic requirement from this uh, base L3DL draft which is uh, collected from, we collected all these requirements from the relevant drafts, and uh, this one has not been fully discussed in the design team. So I just put it here, but maybe it's not uh, directly relevant to the PGP out of, disco out of discovery requirement. Okay, uh, I, I know this is not adopted yet, right? Yeah, yeah, these are what we collected. Okay. Yeah, because I think uh, there are a different uh, layer two. So I think if this requirement uh, uh, is taken into account, I think uh, maybe a little complex. That's my point. Okay. okay. Mm. I think that Torless was next. However, I um, also see a couple of the design team members chiming in on the chat, and um, I'd like to offer them the opportunity to jump the line if they uh, think, think it would be appropriate. appropriate. Randy, jumping the line. Slides eight and nine are specifically not requirements. Don't panic, Robin. Don't panic, Jacob. They were specifically said put on the side, hmm. right? That, that's that's what that go, not on the top is for, right? Yeah, but that was on slide eight and not on slide nine, uh -huh. right? And slides eight and nine were specifically not requirements. We're still looking at them out of the corner of our eyes, but they are not. <laughs> Okay, and I, I, I see Warren also has a, his, his hand up, and he's also a design team member, so I'd like to give him a chance to jump in. Warren Kamari, just clarifying that the layer two stuff, an easier way of explaining that was stuff like BMP. Wow, well, that made everybody stop talking. <laughs> um, just to clarify, the provide layer two keep live messages was um, you know, should this also be used to configure something like BMP because it's a standard part of many people's configs. Um, and as Randy said, these are not adopted, just things people are talking about. Thanks, guys. Um, so uh, Torles had a comment. Yeah, I apologize. I didn't have the time to, to read these um, different proposals, but uh, I was uh, wondering if uh, folks had suggested to use um, some of the building blocks we have done or in the process of doing in the ITF. So one is a CBOR CDDL um, as a way to encode um, message formats and with CDDL have a formal specification language for it, which I think would up level this next generation kind of auto configuration protocol from one of TLVs. Um, and the second one is GRASP, which basically builds on it and is a very simple way to um, you know define standard message exchanges and also extend multicast discovery with very simple flooding and across the layer three domain in case has to be deployed in something that's more than a simple layer two um, a network okay thanks for your suggestion I think uh, about the encoding maybe I can uh, consider it later and um, the country is I think the most most important thing is about the design principles. Uh, once we reach certain consensus on this part, uh, the encoding can be something we discuss uh, how to efficiently code a message and make it more generic. I think this is something I'm 
we can uh, add further in the for, uh, uh, following discussions in the working group. Any other questions or comments? Randy, please go ahead. I think it's just worth noting that um, the group is very much trying to do two things. One is be as simple as possible. And two is to rely at, to do as little as possible just to let BGP open happen because BGP takes care of a lot of stuff once it can open. And, and then uh, we have Jeff in the queue. Uh, this is partially seconding Randy. Uh, thus far, the design team has kept to keeping things fairly simple. Uh, I think the open questions are mostly about uh, where to be intrusive into the protocols. So to offer uh, the example of draft shoe, which is say, described in the chat as being sort of like uh, the LDP hello. LDP hello has uh, impacts on the LDP state machine for the TCP session. BGP does not require that. Um, so we don't have to necessarily get quite that intrusive. So that's one possibility in the uh, interactions. Uh, different examples are what transports things go over. So the feature for the LLDP one was mostly just leveraging existing stuff that is intended for a switch context. Uh, but that's not necessarily useful for contexts that are outside of uh, you know, fabric provisioning, which is our a key topic right now. Uh, that said, mostly our analysis has been falling into what is useful for just getting BTP to come up. Here are the core things that are necessary to get the job done. Encapsulation of that set of information and the transport of it is, I think, going to be somewhat flexible depending on the scenario. Um, I think the one thing that uh, I keep pushing on that's uh, still hasn't gotten a lot of traction in the design team yet. I need to spend time trying to convince people is uh, what's listed as a group ID inside the LLDP, but you know, its general intent is you know, as a piece of information about the role of the device that is attending to uh, establish a BGP session with you. One of the things that I think is an open question, and this is, I think, a little bit easier to see in a switching environment rather than a general service provider environments, is that uh, elements in the network have a role depending on what they're plugged into and what they're supposed to do. So in a standard uh, clo fabric, the leaves are intended to be in a specific place and only intended to talk to their aggregation layer, which are only to, you know, which could talk to one of two layers and the spine can talk to the aggregation layer. You're doing the standard three leaf, uh, three tier process. In such cases, help in the auto configuration to prevent disconnectivity. It's potentially helpful, but it's not a requirement. So I think there are some interesting questions around things that are potentially helpful for uh, either misconnectivity checks or in cases that are outside of fabrics, you know, being able to say things like a uh, device is trying to discover, is this thing a route reflector or not? Uh, there's a different piece of work that uh, AC and I are on for the IGPs for BGP route reflector discovery that has very similar considerations. Anyway, that's my, my statement. Uh, Randy is yeah, next, thank you. Um, just to contrast, um, the Jeff's point's well taken, but the opposite, or not opposite, but complementary view is that the types of roles and the number of roles are not enumerable. Um, they're really 
heavily dependent upon what the operator is doing. And so a mechanism which allows arbitrary um, attributes to be shared before BGP open can cover that case. I'm a spine, I'm a leaf, I'm vanilla ice cream, right? It's operator configured. I think as protocol designers, we're, it's too easy to fall into the classic vendor trap is I know better what the operator should be doing. I've learned over the years, I don't. So as a follow on to that, I agree with Randy. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the ID was left very abstract. Document so that uh, policy uh, could be used to take care of these sorts of things. You know, it's treated basically as a set of tags on the session that use the deployment for appropriate purposes. I don't see anybody else adding themselves to the queue. Oh, I do. Please go ahead. David Kofsky. Hello, this is Adam Bitkama. Uh, Adam Bitkovsky Bitkama. Um, I was just thinking, you know, like when you suggested that that there could be a, a BGP extension in, in form of UDP and all that stuff. Uh, from operator's point of view, I would rather go with the sort of separate protocol uh, where, where I could sort of clearly Define like okay, I'm I'm not running this protocol in my edge, therefore I could better secure my edge as as opposed to have all these extra features or protocol interactions within the protocol that I must run in the at the edge like BGP uh, having enabled. I mean obviously we do secure the edge with the uh, infrastructure ACLs and all that stuff to just specifically match. DCP interaction, but but still, I mean, not all operators do that. So, ideally, there would be a separate protocol too. For for this, at least. Okay, thank you for your comments. Yep, I think that's pretty pretty clear. Um, anybody else want to join the mic line? Jay, it's back to you. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think uh, I finished my presentation, and uh, maybe we need to uh, have some further discussion in the working group uh, about the design principles. We will also work, uh, continue to work on the to make it simple to make a minimal set of the requirements. Uh, we can, can converge on a few mandatory features for this protocol. And based on this tool, we can put them into the document and uh, then the solution right. discussion can happen. Thanks. Um, so a question from the chair is, um, do you guys in the design team have a sense for when you think uh, you can have these next steps done? In, in particular, do you think that maybe we can have the, uh, can reach the final bullet there, hand the solution? Mm. I mean, all of this is next steps to be done in the design team or? Yeah, so. In my understanding, maybe the, if you don't know, then then it's okay. But uh, I, I, is it a reasonable goal for us to say that you know by uh, by summertime we're uh, we're ready to open this you know and publish publish the requirements that you're going to produce and um, or the proposed requirements? I really should say I should be careful about that and and put that back out to the working group. Yeah, I hope we can. Do that maybe on next uh, like a meeting, and we will need more input from the working group, especially on the design principle. 
also like uh, some operators can give some input about whether they prefer it to be a, a relatively independent protocol or it's a part of a, a incremental extension. So, even if it's not uh, that deeply coupled. Let me suggest that if you're um, soliciting input from the working group, um, I mean, it's it's great that you've uh, made this presentation and um, published these slides, and it's uh, probably good to follow up with an um, email to the working group with a pointer to the slides at um, at least. And it it would be fine to go ahead and and create a working group draft or create a draft rather, and you know put this information into the draft as well that that people can reference. Um, that's optional, but I, you know, it's sort of the usual way that we send things to the working group for comment. Right. I'll say so. That's a good way to proceed. Any other comments from you, Sue? Yes, have to stop typing first. Um, I think that uh, maybe you could talk to the working group since we may be in this um, at home situation, maybe we could schedule uh, a targeted uh, IDR discussion on those design principles at, at, toward the end of all of these interims. Uh, maybe we could ask for another one and just focus on what you want to know from the working group on the design principles and have a very short rough draft as well as presentation for that. That way we can push this along so that maybe by summer when we might get to have a ITF face-to-face -face meeting, we could have both the common requirements and and uh, some thoughts, uh, uh, straw man uh, proposal on the design principles. Just, just a thought and uh, I'd be glad to talk about that offline as well, G. So Randy says uh, in the chat, which summer, which I take to be a ha ha, I'm only serious kind of comment um, this summer. I don't think we're going to have a face to face this summer. And oh. I don't think, um, I think the working group, the, the design team is about to enter. Um, the pressure point where we have to make some crux decisions on what the in, the information is now f sort of roughly agreed, but the transport and the encoding are the key points and in like investigating whether LLDP really will do, um, whether we have to invent something wonderful and new, so on and so forth. And I don't think I think that's why you made a design team and having that for the whole working group is probably not going to focus the discussion. Uh, uh, yes. 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 I hope that we would specifically have a proposal from the design team. Do you think we'll, um, G and Randy, do you think we'll get to, uh, do you need to have your design principles agreed to before you get to the discussion of transport and uh, coatings? I mean, that's what I take it to. I mean, I'm just looking at, at G's list of bullets. So it's, and I, I take that to be in, you know, serialized order, so requirements, design principles, requirement document, and handoff, which makes, it makes sense to me. Um, and and the reason that I put the question uh, a few minutes ago was just um, that that G had asked specifically for, for working group input. And so that seemed like a good time to to ask about um, kind of what your timeline looks like and, and so on. Um, I do see, uh, Jeff saying in the chat, I agree with Randy and Warren saying, yup, um, which 
I, I was confused enough by what Randy said to not be exactly sure what they're agreeing with other than I think what Randy said is we're not done yet and please don't jiggle our elbows too much um, until we've completed the task you set to set us, um, which makes sense to me. I, I, I do not want to jiggle your elbow. Um, we will schedule, schedule a, um, um, I'm getting an echo. echo. We'll, we'll, we'll schedule an interim when you guys are ready for it. Um, I think we're making progress, John, just not at a screaming pace, but I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. And given the year of the plague, um, you can beat us up in June or July if we don't have progress to report. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, and I, I see that Jeff has put himself in the mic queue also. Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, so I, where I think I agree with Randy, the, the issue with trying to issue even like a preliminary draft of some form right now is we've done a couple of levels of decomposition, which you saw G present. What I think is need to be done is some of those secondary features probably need to be discussed, uh, either be included or ruled out or to decide if we're going to have you know, some level of optional features in these things. Um, but the bigger problem with trying to present it at this point is that uh, we're going to end up, I think, with, again, here's the functional components that are part of uh, the common proposals. There's going to be transports, and there's going to be a few other points. If we present them now, effectively, what we'd be giving to the working group is this large cross product that could suggest any number of implementations. Right, which is exactly what we hope to avoid by chartering the design team. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree too. That's that's not what I hoped to get out of the design team is a giant laundry list. Um, so, just to be clear, my my comments about you know, if you want input from the working group, please focus it by sending you know a list of questions, sending your slides, um, and or sending a draft to the mailing list. That's if you want input from the working group. I'm not saying you must do this. Does that make sense? Not hearing anybody say, John, that doesn't make sense. Either you think I'm so far off in, in left field that um, you don't even want to say or you agree. Okay. Um, further comments, further questions? Otherwise, I think um, I think we're done with this one. Um, thank you very much, uh, G, for presenting. Thank you to the whole design team for working to put push this forward in, as Randy points out, a difficult time. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. I have one today. I'm going to present request for candidate pass for SR policy. Next page. Right now, uh, head end of uh, SR policy and note uh, will receive a uh, candidate pass for SR policy uh, through different ways. For example, through configuration, through BGP SR policy, or through as our policy. So what is, we can summarize this as a controller in, initiates. However, sometimes uh, we may uh, want head end to initiate or some kind of uh, SR policy. Because some, some, when some event happens, head end would like to control or some single point to generate SR policy, that policy satisfies some requirement from the head end. And then that central point will generate the candidate pass, which satisfies that requirement from the head end, and then send this SR pass, send those candidate pass, which satisfy the requirement to the head end, and then and then can create a forward angel, a create a pass. So in fact, this uh, uh, kind of is already existing uh, in the PCE. 
extend BGP to have this kind of uh, functions. So in fact, the extension is simple. We just uh, use existing SR policy, and we define some new uh, stuff as a, a request parameters. Next page. So right now we have a, a existing SR policy, and then we have previous version. So this is the second version. So here, uh, in compared to the previous version, we uh, made some updates. So basically, the updates is highlighted in the blue color. In these updates, we define a new request sub TLV, and then we update two uh, sub TLVs. So all these uh, extensions will uh, include those informations for the request from head end to the single point or controllers. So next page. So this is a new uh, sub TLV. We call the request parameter uh, sub TLV. So this uh, sub TLV will contain a request ID because for each request, we would like to have a, a ID to identify this request. In addition to these request IDs, uh, we also have some kind of uh, uh, parameters to indicate the request. For example, we may have a flag to indicate that this request is for re-optimization of the existing path. Okay. Oh. Hello? Any question? I'd please, everybody who's not Huaymo, please mute. So we have a we define three flags. One is for re-optimization. Another one is we have the indication whether we want the bi-directional path. And the, the, the third option, uh, the third flag is that uh, we, whether we want a loose pass or strict pass. So that's uh, about the, this uh, a new request parameter sub TLV. Next page. We also uh, added the details about the synchronized sub TLV. In fact, this is a, uh, uh, oh, oh, Originally, we have uh, SFAC, the synchronization factor. So we just change the name uh, to synchronization sub TLV. So in this synchronization sub TLV, uh, we uh, add more information because we want to synchronize multiple requests. So we need to have those request IDs for those multiple requests. As soon as we have multiple request IDs, then the central controller can compute the path to consider all these requests at the same time. So this is the, the updates for the synchronization sub of these. So next page. This is, uh, we just updated this uh, sub TLV. We changed the name and uh, we also uh, changed the format of uh, this sub TLV. This is sub TLV just uh, describes the attributes of SR path, such as ex exclude all, any, include any, uh, include all. So this is uh, similar to the LSP path attributes. So next page. Yeah, I think that's all the updates uh, for this uh, draft. So I would like to request the comments from the working group. I see a um, long comment in the um, chat from uh Keta and he said I don't need to get to a mic <laughs> okay I will read your comment then because I think that we should try to keep it in one conversation it says this draft proposes an extension for BGP to support a request response mechanism for SR policy we know that BGP does not natively support such transaction mechanism unlike PSAP 
Can the authors please describe how this mechanism is supposed to work and how such SR policies are going to be maintained? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's uh, uh, we propose this one, and then we want to uh, have some uh, uh, comment from the working group. Right now, so uh, here the extension is that we use the existing SR policy, but in this SR policy, when, when this SR policy working as a request, we use a special flag. For example, we propose to use a distinguisher, use a FFF, and then when we set that one, that value sent from head end to the controller, that means it's a request. And then uh, after controller request, uh, receive this request, and then controller may do some special processing. Oh, this is a request, and then I can reply to the head end. So this is a one proposal for for the extension to PGP. I think maybe uh, the other person can give suggestions. So I'm putting myself in the mic line, um, speaking as a working group member. Um, I just have sort of a fundamental um, question or concern, which is, I mean, let me say it in both ways. Uh, the question is, um, as you pointed out, PCEP has this. Um, why do we need to reinvent PCEP? And the concern is that, uh, as you've just sort of talked through, uh, it's not really a natural fit for BGP. BGP has things like state compression that um, really mess with the whole idea of uh, request protocols. Um, so it seems like, you know, number one, um, we already have one, why do we need two? And number two, if we were to invent a second one, I'm not, I, I don't think I would choose BGP as the, the container to stick it inside. Um, so I'll stop talking and hear your reaction. Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh... Uh, P, uh, PSAP have uh, uh, this uh, uh, request and reply uh, protocols there. So why do we need uh, to do the, uh, the same thing in the BGP? So the thing is that right now, uh, PC working as a controller, so they have that kind of request and reply uh, protocol. So BGP is also a user as a, a controller. So it looks like uh, we have some kind of requirement to have this kind of a request and the reply. So that's a, that, that's a for the first question. For the second question is that, I know you're right, the BGP is already have some kind of things there and then we shouldn't the, uh, broken the BGP or change BGP's behavior too much. So that's a, for second question. So my opinion is that since, we have a, since we have BGP as a controller, and then we have this kind of requirement. So this should we have to just uh, find some way to adapt to BGP, and then that might BGP to have the same or similar functions. Those kind of uh, request and reply. So that's a, a my opinion to you answer to your second questions. Okay, thank you. And sort of putting back on my meeting moderator hat, I'm just gonna read the uh, comments that were put into the chat. Um, so Jeff Tensora says plus one, I think to my mic comment, Jacob Hyde says, I also think BGP is not a request response protocol. Why not use PSAP? Jeff Haas says, more, more importantly, BGP regularly fails to be request response. Um, and then he makes an editorial comment about BES, which I won't repeat. Um, Ketan says, it is not just request reply, but also need to maintain the SR policy through its entire lifetime. It would help the working group if the authors could describe the entire proposal in sufficient details, i.e. the entire life cycle of the SR policy. And that's all the comments. Yeah, regarding the details, I think this uh, we just post the uh, uh, second version and then in the uh, likes next version, and then we may uh, details and then also address comments from uh, the 
ที่พกโอเค I right now with you know sort of working group chair hat on I think you you have some skepticism to overcome um, so uh, I think creating that if 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 you if you choose to proceed forward I would I would encourage you to fill in that detail um, yeah thank you yeah. Any other comments for the mic? Otherwise, I think we can probably move on. Okay, next please, thank you. So these are, uh, uh, we're talking about the BGP for network uh, availability, uh, next page. So right now we know uh, central controller uh, is, is used more and more in the network to control the network. And then BGP is uh, one option to work as a, a controller. So since a controller is a, a single point of failure for the light work, if we uh, if a light work is controlled by uh, it, a central controller. So in order to uh, provide the reliability or availability of a light work, so uh, people propose using that uh, controller cluster, which contain uh, two controllers and then a number of control more or more controllers. That's one option for uh, in, to in, enhance the uh, enhance the uh, reliability of the controller. So another way is that we can use uh, multiple controllers work at the same time. So that and, and uh, the more options for controller reliabilities. So first we focus on network uh, controller clusters for this kind of uh, architectures uh, reliability. So for controller uh, cluster, so when the failure happens in the cluster, they may split into different uh, separate uh, cluster groups. After split, so each group will elect themselves as a uh, uh, primary controller group and then control the network. So in this case, because of the uh, cluster split it, and then they don't know each other and then they're out of sync and then they also control the network at the same time and then we may have uh, issues. So in, in order to resolve this issue and then one proposal is that even though the cluster is split, it, but uh, all the controllers in order to control the network, they still have connections to the network. And then we can use some of these connections to exchange information about the separated controllers. And then in this way, and then the separate controller will know each other, even though we have multiple failures in the cluster. And then they can make a direct decisions to select one primary controller group, and then let the data con primary controller group to control the network, and then we, we can have a more reliable network. <coughs> That's the rough idea. So next page. So the idea is that, so we can let uh, every controller in the, con uh, in the controller cluster have an uh, information kernel to one network element one network element. For example, we can every controller have a PHP session to P3. So since a private controller already have a session to every to F8 node, so we, we can use that controller channel as the information channel. For the secondary or third uh, controller, we can have an extra session or special session to add the same element and then use that special session as an information channel to have uh, change the information among the controllers when the uh, cluster have multiple failures. So after cluster have failure uh, and then cluster split in multiple separate groups, so only each group will select uh, uh, to the selections I mean, they will select a primary, secondary, and, and, the, and the third, secondary. But each group will do the selection. And then only the intended primary group in that group 
will send the information about that group to that same network element. And then that network element will transmit those information to the other controllers. So in this way, even though we have multiple layers in the cluster, and then the cluster is split in multiple separate group, because we have this information channel to exchange information about controllers, then every controller will have the whole picture of each controllers, and then they can select the primary controller or primary group correctly, and then that primary group will control the network correctly. So that's the rough idea about the uh, this, uh, uh, these things. So next page. So here uh, we talk about the sending information from the primary intended primary controller to the other controllers through a network element. So here in the normal situation, only primary controller will send the information. So the information will include the primary controller's current position. So we have one, two, three, four. One means primary, two means secondary, three means secondary, and so on. And the current position of this, this uh, controller and the older position of this controller, and then this controller's priority to become a primary controller. And the number of controllers in this group, in this cluster, and then the controller's IDs in this group, such if we have a controller A, B, and C, and then controller A's ID, B's ID, and C's ID, and so on. So this is uh, the information the controller or primary controller will send it to the other controllers through a lateral element. So after failure in the clusters, so we may have a number of separate controller groups. So each group will select its intended control, primary controller and the intended second controller and so on. So only the intent, intended primary controller in each group will send the, those informations to the other controllers through a network element. And then after every controller have those information, they will determine the correct primary group. So after the controller determine that the primary uh, primary controller group, and then that primary controller group will control the network. So that's the uh, rough idea. So in the case, because of, in the case that the two group are tied for compete to the primary group, so we have also proposed some kind of tie breaking rules. For example, if we have tie, and so the rule, for example, we have a rule that the maximum number of controllers, the group has maximum number of controllers will be will be win for the election. So in the case that if two groups have same number of controllers, they are tied. In this case, we may use we may use the parameter the older position number. So if one group has an older has a bigger or higher over position number, and then they will win. So that will break, break the, the ties. So in so in, in any case, one only one primary group will be elected. So after we have all the information. So next page. Next page. This is the uh, information we're going to uh, distribute, I mean, for the extension. So first, uh, we need to extend BGP to uh, have uh, capabilities. This is capabilities for support uh, a controller HA. We have a trip. We have uh, this kind of uh, capability triple. And then we have a flag, a C flag. So C flag means that uh, if a controller send this uh, capability, that we are sending C flag one. If network element send this kind of a, a capability, it will send this C flag to zero, means I'm a network element. Next page. So this is a, a new 
NLR RI on the new IT study, and then this uh, LRI will contain those information I already talked about, will contain uh, position, old position, priority, and the number of controller in the group, and those controller IDs in, in, the, in this uh, uh, group, in this cluster. Next page. So this is uh, talking about uh, recovery uh, procedures. So when a cluster has failures and then cluster split into multiple groups, and then each group will select its uh, intended intend primary, intended secondary, and then only the intended primary controller will send the information to a light of element. So in the normal case, because we uh, have a cluster, only the primary controller in that cluster will send the, uh, those information. So after the failure, and then each group, only the intent primary controller in that group will send the information about this group. So after each group send those information, and then every group will have information about the other group. And then, only one primary group will be elected correctly. And then those, and that one primary group will control the network. So that's the uh, idea of uh, uh, the recovery procedure. So next page. I think that's all about this uh, draft. And uh, I would like to request comments from the working group. Okay, we have uh, two people in the mic line, Linda and then Jeff Tensura. Hi, this is Linda. Thank you very much for the presentation. So um, I'm just curious, like uh, today's uh, many applications used, they have many, many instances and uh, to the uh, client or to the, uh, the, the peer, they appear as one. So if you use a virtual IP address to represent the cluster of PGP controllers, then they can decide among themselves who will be in main control of uh, synchronizing all the information. But to the PE, the BGP, they will be the same. There's no, no difference from PE perspective. I'm just curious, why don't you use that way? Well, this I think uh, the, the cluster from outside point of view is, is one controller. Yes. But, but inside is a uh, multiple uh, controllers right right so so that just just detach it from bgp per se you have a class of controllers you may have synchronization among each other but to the pe perspective when they uh, propagate the routes when they uh, receive the routes it's all the same it's coming from one entity maybe it's a virtual entity they don't really care which one send it to them yes yes you're right from outside point of view is one entity but from inside the point of view, there are multiple entities. But within inside, we may have multiple failures. And then because without a failure, those entities inside, they were synchronized. But if we have failure, that split those uh, one entity into multiple entities, it will be out of sync. And then because after a split, then they, because they're out of sync, they don't know each other, and then they will they will elect themselves as a primary controller, and the multiple entity will elect themselves as as a primary controllers, and then those primary multiple primary controllers will try to control the network, and then we may have issues. So we need to we need to have some way after we split, and then we still get the information and still know each other, and then we can select one real primary controller or controller group correctly. That's the intention here. Yeah, yes, you can do the same way with virtual IP to represent the cluster of them. Say, um, basically from PE's perspective, they, they just receive from this vir one virtual IP address to, to the controller. And if the cluster fail, one cluster fail, other, other cluster fail, you can have a, a load balance to, to, to select elect one. So my, my point is uh, you have many more PEs uh, than the controllers. So just keep the PE behavior the same and then have the controllers 
um, decide among themselves to choose one. Yeah, I think uh, maybe uh, my understanding that you are talking about uh, multiple controllers working at the same time, right? Is that the case? So I think so just for a class of controllers, you coordinate with each other on which one to control. Just take P out of the picture, let themselves elect the right one, but you just have a one virtual IP address to represent all of them. But if you have one IP address, but because inside the the split, how can the communicate? That's the issue, right? So um, maybe we can leave it there for this part of the conversation. I, I think um, Jeff Tansura, did you want to add anything? Yeah, very, very similar comment. I mean, there's a number of very advanced schemes to provide database synchronization. We've been doing it for 30 years. BGP is definitely one, not one of them. And uh, I mean, I, I don't really see reason to do it this way. And AC Linden was also in the queue. Yeah, I, I mean, I noticed we, you know, we, we have some, you have, well, it, it makes, that's the big question is these, these um, clusters are going to have to be talking to them each other anyway. Why would you move, why would you just do this, uh, this high availability election outside of it and put in BGP? Doesn't make any sense. And it, make, it makes even less sense. Makes even less sense to put it in the high piece, and I know, I know, I know you got to <laughs> blanket across all of them because then it goes to the whole routing domain. I don't know why you put this this piece in BGP of this of this uh, election, and uh, and it almost seems like it should go someplace else. It should go in the in this whatever you're doing between those controllers. You know, we're not to the point. We're not to the point where you can just take uh, controller A off the shelf and controller B off the shelf and run them. And having this little piece standardized isn't, you know, with all the synchronization itself between the control clusters doesn't make doesn't make any sense at all from a requirement standpoint to me. I'm adding my. Uh, this provide uh, uh, another way. I, I know, yeah, there's lots of uh, synchronizations for those kind of uh, states. This is a provider uh, another way, and then maybe this way, uh, whether it's better or not, I think maybe maybe need to get the more in the more details. So um, this is John Scudder. I'm adding myself to the queue as a meeting participant. Um, so, well, actually, first, as as a moderator, I will pass on Tony Prigenja saying, uh, in fact, inventing Paxos over BGP is a curious idea, idea. So I agree with AC. And then for myself, I will add, yeah, this is basically a group consensus protocol that you're trying to invent. And there are various places where you can get it off the shelf. Uh, you might want to take a look at Zookeeper. Um, I also don't really see a, a need to stick it into BGP. End of comment. And back back to moderator hat. Uh, are there any further comments? If not, I think we can move forward. Or or um, oh, Jacob Heights also uh, wants to put himself in the line. So Jacob, please go ahead. Oh, I was just about to um, echo uh, Jeff Tantura's uh, comment um, about um, if. Uh, um, because you didn't say it on the actual mic, um, but, but I agree with him and uh, that if there is any connectivity, <clears throat> um, if any PE um, or NE um, can uh, speak to uh, more than one controller, then, then those two controllers can route through it to each other and therefore you do not have a partition. So the only way you can have a partition is if all of the PEs are also partitioned. Um, and I'll relay a comment from Robert. He says, yep, I said that same comment about Zookeeper a few weeks back on the IDR list. So, um, Waimo, I don't know if you have any responses or comments or if anybody else wants to add themselves to the queue. Uh, 
Yeah, as I mentioned that because uh, we may have uh, some kind of synchronization of magnetism already there, I think maybe this one, I think maybe is the most uh, simpler. For example, so for those kind of synchronization is inside and then some those in, uh, synchronization paths may be broken, as I mentioned, because of multiple failure inside the controller. So however, controller always have connections to the network element. So this is a connection is more persistent. So the other con connections among the controller is broken, but we still have connections through network element. And then we can use this path to do the synchronization among the, those separated controllers, right? So this is a, another option there. And then this is a it provide extra availability is there, and then we may use it. And also this one is very simple. We just uh, only the intent uh, private controllers send the information through that element and then through the other controllers. So also the, the information is a minimum. Okay, uh, sounds like we have come to the end. Thank you. Um, Thank you, everyone. So next, please. John, this is Sue. Did I miss one? I must have missed one. Hold on. Okay. Uh, I have next uh, Giuseppe Piccola. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, there you are. As, as these, these are not my slides. So yes, we... yes, that's what I that's what I said. I have one. One okay. moment while I get that. John, uh, I'm going to have to download them. Do you have them on your? Uh, slide projector already in yeah which i think have... i can project if we can figure out how to pass Otherwise, the ball to me, me. I'll just pass, take... it, pass me the ball and i'll project okay uh, just are uh, you uh host number two yeah. yep you've got it okay one moment I'll download just for background. Sure. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Giuseppe, one of the co author of this new 00, 00 version draft that uh, is a BGP SR policy extensions to enable uh, in situ flow information telemetry. So, next, uh, the background and motivation for this, uh, this new draft is very simple. So, we all know that. The SR policy is identified through a end color and endpoint information. And an add end may be informed of the candidate path for an SR policy in different ways. And with this draft, uh, is going to investigate the segment routing T policy ways to do that through BGP. And uh, in particular, the documents aims to define um, the extension to BGP to distribute SR policies in order to uh, and uh, to uh, enable the in situ flow information telemetry. In this way, um, several on path telemetry methods, like just to mention the, the most famous one, like in bando M and alternate marking, 
can be enabled automatically when the SR, the SR policy is applied. So next, uh, just a quick uh, review of the uh, in situ flow information telemetry framework for uh, VOOM. For, I don't know many people is already familiar uh, with the, this framework, but basically it's very simple. It's the framework architecture that want to uh, univocally define how the uh, on-path telemetry techniques can be applied in several situations. In particular, um, we can mention in Bando M alternate marking, but there are also others like hybrid two steps or other techniques that are um, investigated in the IPPM working group, for example. And the DIFIT frameworks also allowed the, the so-called reflection loop telemetry application. This means that um, the controller, on the controller side, we can get telemetry information from the network and based on this telemetry information that we can get, uh, we can configure new actions, new configuration to the network in order to use this loop, configure in a better way our performance measurement. So in next slide. So as, um, as I said before, uh, the idea is to enable the on-path data plane telemetry for SR policies. And the, this framework allows the flexibility and uh, in particular address the deployment challenge for most of this data plane method. So in particular, um, all these methods to be applied have different challenges uh, regarding the performance, the deployability, the flexibility. So this framework aims to facilitate the deployment of these methods uh, in order to allow the um, flow selection, the dynamic network probing, the on-demand technique integration, and so on. Uh, next. Coming back to the real scope of our draft after this introduction of um, in situ flow information telemetry, uh, the idea is very straightforward and simple. So, uh, considering the SR policy encoding structure, we are going to define new sub TLDs uh, that we can say we can call them IFIT attributes in order to. Um, uh, install and apply to the candidate uh, our uh, IFIT performance uh, measurement technique. So, for example, if we go to the next slides, we can see the, some details about that. For example, the SR policy for inbound OM, we can check the sub TLV for different uh, inbound OM um, options like the trace option, the direct directly export options sub TLV, the edge to edge options sub TLV, and we can see that in sub TLV um, there are all the information that are needed to um, configure and to activate the inbound OM uh, option. And uh, in while in the next slide we can see the SR policy for, for alternate marking. And um, this is based on the RFC 8321 and multipoint alt mark. Draft and uh, also in this case, there are all the information that are needed to um, configure and to activate the performance measurement. So, next, okay. this is, as I said, there is a, an adjusted introduction of this new draft. We are we would like to collect feedbacks to have questions and comments that are welcome. Thanks. I don't see anybody in the mic queue yet, but we'll give it just a few seconds. Um, if anybody would like to comment or ask questions, please do. Uh, hi, uh, uh, my name is Rakesh. Uh, so, um, question is this uh, only for the end to end case, or um, you plan to do something for hop by hop case as well? Yeah, for, for both cases, also hop by hop. 
for DSR policies or also for op by op for SR path, so for all the op on the of DSR path. There is also, okay. we are working also uh, in an accompanying document for, um, so for PCE so to do the same work, the, um, in order to also we are investigating how to generalize this for all the PC protocol and uh, yeah. That is you're saying we will have so you're saying we will have solution for both this BGP base as well as PCF base. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that is the idea. This is Adam Witkowski. Um, um, so I would like to ask: Is this to? So you're basically looking at gathering telemetry on a hub by hub basis in order to influence the path the tunnel is taking. If if that's the case, what what kind of telemetry are you looking at? Is it is it sort of performance or any uh, type of? Yeah, not all the types of monitoring, but for example, um, alternate marking is one of the methodology that is, by definition, is op by op allowed op by op uh, measurement. And the same also for inbound OM for trace option is also op by op. It depends by the which kind of uh, on path telemetry we are going to to activate. And it's also managed by the controller side. So uh, it is up to the controller based on which kind of service and which kind of traffic we are going when we would like to monitor. We can, the idea is to activate the most suitable uh, performance method that is available. Um, for example, like alternate marking or Nibando M or hybrid to step or um, IFA. So there are several methodologies that there are several proposals in IPPM that goes in this direction. And the idea is to add the flexibility to activate the most suitable methods uh, that is needed. If uh, you don't have any follow-ups, then Jeff is next. Uh, so I guess my question here is, what level of dynamic behavior are you looking to trigger with this? Is this something you're looking to leave on paths all the time or to sort of trigger on demand? Um, okay. the, the flexibility is, um, is bought on the, um, there are several kind, I think, of, um, Flexibility, for example, you can allow the on-path telemetry uh, that can make the op by op measurement. But for example, if in case uh, you don't need a so detailed information because the SLA are not so important for that kind of traffic, you can just uh, configure an end-to-end. -end so this is the kind of flexibility that uh, I mean. So um, you can start to monitor your network without going deep in uh, your um, in all the monitoring details. And then if a problem comes, you can specify better the um, flow selection criteria, the flow selection, the the most suitable uh, performance measurement method that allow you to get the important information. For example, uh, you can prefer um, synthetic traffic to measure, so the so-called active measurement or passive measurement or also hybrid. So these three categories uh, have different uh, characteristics in terms of information that you can get, in terms of um, Quality and in terms, and um, 
in terms of detailed information. So we all know that the active probing is not so detailed like the passive or hybrid uh, probing. So this is what what we mean for flexibility and um, dynamic approach. Uh, the motivation for my question is that BGP does best when paths are stable. And if this stuff is being added and removed very regularly, it will cause the equivalent of uh, route churn. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, yeah, we that's why we we are investigating both the BGP and the um, PC because uh, maybe there are several scenarios where we can use it's better to use BGP and other scenarios where it's better to use PC. Um, yes, so the flexibility is it depends. So it can be real time, but also we can say near real time, but also we can say a flexibility that can be for a period of weeks or months. It, it depends by which scenarios we we are investigating, but. I agree with you. So, so your motivation is to do a path analysis rather than an individual forwarding element. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, correct. My my gut assumption is that PCE may be a better fit, but uh, I believe the PCE people that are on this call will have a better opinion. Yeah. I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. That was a, a bit of a leading question in case anybody wants to make comments about PCE. Um, otherwise, uh, I think we are done with this one. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So, shall I just continue projecting? It's easy enough. Uh, we'll do that. Okay, here we go. See who's our speaker on this one. Going to see Yali Wang. Yali Wang, are you on the call? I see him in the list, John. I'm just not hearing him. Ellie, are you on the call? So, Yali is the next two talks. Um, why don't we go on to? He, he says he says he's speaking. Can we hear him? We Let's cannot. Give it a moment. Uh, let me make sure that he's really right up like back and forth like that unmuted. Uh, he is. He is on his headset, but it does not look it is working. Yali G um, normally dials in. If you can find a phone to dial in, we will pick you up then. We need to give him a moment. Yeah, I will check with Yali how how to help you how to dial in. Okay, I think what while you're doing that, we will proceed. Uh, Linda, are you ready to present? Uh, this is Linda. I request to present at next session because my slide I don't think is. I need to add a few more things to my slides. I see. Okay. Uh, all right, um, let's take five minutes, everybody, um, for a quick break uh, and give Yelly just a few minutes to try to get uh, audio working. Hopefully that will be possible. Um, and then we'll reconvene in a few in a few minutes. So time now plus five minutes, which my local time would be 1124. Um, John, since yes. um, you have a few minutes, may I ask a question to the group? Uh, really, just to repeat the question I sent to the mailing list. 
go for it. Okay, so this is really for my draft. I didn't quite um, put in this, um, the, the document, revise the document clearly yet. I just want to get the feedback from the, the IDEA working group. So this is for the um, SD-1 uh, segmentation. So in the deployment, we need um, um, different instances um, to represent, uh, need a way to represent different SD-1 segmentations or SD-1 instances. It's very, very similar to um, VPN um, instance. Uh, so um, based on uh, Robert's um, suggestion, using the route target to do it, um, I think that's a great way to do use the um, uh, extended property um, route target. But we would like to um, use a different name instead of calling route target, which is same as VPN, um, just to so that for the CPE uh, who already support the VPN to have a different name. Would that be a problem? We call a different name. Same purpose as route target, we call it SD1 target. Would that be a problem? Anybody has any feedback on that? Yep, the floor is open for comments. No. As I'm concerned, as you know, as as a working group member, um, you can call it whatever you like, as long as you make it extremely clear what it is, what namespace it's taken from, and all you know the other things that you want in a spec. Okay, thank you. And um, also, a uh, second question is similar uh, as VPN, right? In the VPN, um, different um, instances, different VPN can have their own private addresses, and they can use the route distinguisher to distinguish different uh, uh, routes belong to different uh, instances. So we would like to use similar approach as well. Um, but I'm just concerned of using uh, the SAFI 128 because uh, 128 has specific um, semantics associated with it. Um, would that be a problem? Any objections? Sorry, what exactly is the thing you're asking? Would it be a problem to use SAFI 128 to not use SAFI 128? I'm not clear. Okay, so we would like to use um, um, similar approach as SAFI 128, but call use a different uh, SAFI. Um, because just to di distinguish um, the routes is actually it's not VPN routes. It's not injected to the um, particular VRF. It's really for the SD1. So um, in the IANA, we uh, already apply the SAFI uh, for SD1. Um, so can we use that SAFI instead? Any objections? I see a, a comment from Robert in the chat. He says, maybe take new AFI. New AFI. But AFI, only two, right? One is um, IPv4, IPv6. And then SAFI has so many, and we already applied one. I already assigned one for SD1. Would that be easier instead of going through another new AFI? The, the thing is, uh, for the um, a propagation of the SD1 property is really between the um, edge node to its controller. And then controller can use this constraint uh, route target to distribute to the relevant um, peers, right? So we'll not go through other routers. So we don't have the issues of um, uh, backward compatibility, like some routers in the middle doesn't recognize that and drop it. We don't have that issue. Robert, go ahead. Yeah, so Linda, so I, I don't think there is um, really a problem with uh, different SAFI from the draft perspective of RFC perspective. The issue is with leveraging the implementation, right? Because if you're using different SAFI, now you either have single implementation to handle um, VPN routes, or now you diverge the code to do different code bases, which is very difficult to maintain. So that's really a um, difficult question to really answer in IDF. It's, it's a vendors who will suffer if you just make a different SAFI just for the heck of it, right? You have to really have a case for, for, for diversity here. 
Oh, okay. Uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. So the implementation uh, uh, perspective um, actually is uh, you need different implementation. Uh, for one, that um, with SD1 case, you have um, you, you're injecting into different route table. Uh, for two, for the SD1 case, which is different from the traditional VPN, um, you have different um, 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 egress port on the router. And depending on different egress port, you may have different properties. Some egress port, you need uh, encryption. Some egress port, you don't need encryption. So that has to be added. Uh, so from implementation point, uh, perspective, it's actually uh, much uh, simpler to use SD1 SAFI. Okay, I mean, I understand what your, what your point is. And, and also to, to actually play um, from the perspective of isolation, maybe it's a feature to isolate layer 3 VPN from SD1 VPN even if you're using the same PE. So they may be pros and cons. I'm just saying, let, let's let's make them um, discuss on the list pros and cons and, and reach some consensus, right? Uh, okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank sense. you, John, for giving me this few minutes to post the question. Sure, and I, no trouble. And I see a comment from Sue also. Sue, did you want to say something? It has everything I've uh, wanted to say. I don't need to add anything. Okay. And then um, Don Eastlake comments, there are, are actually more AFIs available than SAFIs, which is true. It's, it's a two byte space. So um, then my question is, since I haven't been in IDR group for a very long time, why um, all the extensions go to SAFI instead of go to AFI? Is there any history associated with it? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, as Jeff says in the chat, AFI is the, is the address type. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's called an address family. So I think people have instinctively been like, well, this is only to be used for address families. And then SAFI has, um, been used for you know, subtypes underneath those things. Um, I, in, in, in my personal opinion, it's, it's sort of, it's kind of unfortunate that we even split it up into two different spaces because really it ends up being like, there's just a, a three byte number that means here's a particular behavior. Um, okay. Oh yeah, R Robert says almost the same thing in the chat. Yeah, I agree. So okay. it's, it's, it's kind of a historical artifact. Okay, so you could have saying, hey, this is a public IP address or this is a private IP address, maybe duplicate from another uh, VPN, then I call it different address type. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you want to have some kind of logic to, to your selection so that people can understand what the heck you're doing. But beyond that, um, I, I don't really see an impediment to you know, doing it out of, you know, they're, they're both just code points that let you select a behavior. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so I'm I'm afraid that we're not having much luck. Let's give Yali two more minutes. That'll put us at the half hour. Um, and if we've got audio by then, great. We still have enough time to proceed forward. And if not, um, we will drop off and um, try to continue at our next session. I guess while we're waiting for Yali to get audio, um, I'll just jump the gun and, and you know, say things that I would say as final comments otherwise, which is um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I, I think this has been really actually exceeded, I don't know about anybody else's expectations, but exceeded my expectations in terms of seeing if we can use a, a virtual meeting as a, um, substitute for the for an in-person meeting um and uh if you've got if you've got any feedback for for what went well what went poorly how we can use these kinds of sessions in the future or anything else please send them you know either to the list if you want or to you know either or both of the chairs um but uh yeah thanks a ton
Oh, hey, Yali, seems like uh, you have audio. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I think maybe you have uh, audio going on two different devices right now, and I would say turn off the audio on whatever device you're not speaking into. I'm trying, I'm trying to, to stop this problem. Stop this problem. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hey, yeah, no echo now, I think. Uh, yeah. No, I'm wrong. Uh, uh, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so you'll typically get that kind of echo if you have the mic and you and and on and you have another device that you're getting audio out of, even if the mic's not active on it. Oh, and Randy points out that yet another person has their. Um, has their mic open while they're typing. This is true also. Okay, I'm gonna... Song, I think you need to, to uh, stop typing. Okay, Yali, why don't you go ahead, please? Okay. Sorry for this problem. You're all learning, and uh, we still have time to, to have your presentations. So um, please start when when you're ready. Yelly, you still there? Uh -oh. And she's still on uh, user eight, which I think was her dial in number. Let's give it a moment. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Please uh, go ahead. I'm projecting your slides. Okay, thank you. Okay, this document uh, will introduce a way to advertise in Sergio Flow information telemetry node capability through uh, IGP and VPLS for protocol extension. Next up. So, um, across the IFIT framework, uh, IFIT to uh, provide a uh, high level uh, reference uh, framework and reflection, a loop working solution for a family of um, uh, telemetry techniques. So, at present, uh, as we all know, there are family of emerging on past telemetry techniques, uh, including IOM, uh, post par best telemetry, uh, IOM direct export, and it has uh, automatic uh, marking. So, um, so that 
uh, depends on the definition of the IFAS domain in the IFAS framework draft. And the IFAS domain is a part of the network which can explore IFAS, uh, which may uh, cross multiple uh, network domains. So within an IFAS domain, these are uh, unpassed metric techniques may be selective, uh, selectively or uh, partially implemented in different devices. So that in order to uh, dynamically enable I free some uh, functionality in a network domain, it is necessary to advertise and collect the I fit node capability information. That is um, uh, the I fit option types supported in these devices. So uh, in less documents, we extend uh, IGP and BGPS uh, protocol uh, for uh, IFIT node cap capability advertisement. Next, So uh, you may ask question that why is it necessary to advertise that it's not capability? So here uh, we list two applications to answer this question. Uh, so the first one is to avoid the leak of IFIT specific header and the mental data. So um, as we know, so within an IFIT domain, one or more IFIT option types may be added into package at the I face in capital uh, capital uh, so uh, losing a node and uh, finally the header and mental data will be removed at the decapsulating node. So uh, uh just necessary to advertise the capability uh, of the end node. I mean the decapsulation uh, node uh, to the centralized controller to make sure uh, the I think of things types supported in the devices. And the second one application is in order to adapt to the different uh, network condition and uh, different application requirements. And centralized uh, controller needs to switch different take uh, telemetry techniques uh, dyna uh, dynamically and automatically. So, uh, so, so here we we also extend the uh, protocol to uh, signaling the I think node capability uh, to the centralized controller to determine uh, better. I think uh, application uh, can be supposed in a uh, given network domain. So this is the two application uh, here we list. Next, please. So uh, uh, before we extend the uh, IGP and BGPL uh, pro uh, protocols, we first define the I think about the capability information here uh, because we considering uh, five categories uh, of I think option types uh, we, we, uh, the, in the first paragraph. Uh, so, uh, and we, we also considering um, some subset or all the I think option types and, uh, uh, and their own co uh, corresponding I think set of uh, field can be associated to an IFIT namespace. So here we define the uh, IFIT node capability information uh, our set of, of one or more pairs of uh, namespace ID and uh, option types enabled in, in uh, as you in this uh, uh, figure. The next uh, space ID uh, is a uh, 16-bit identified defined in the previous uh, uh, dot, and the option type enable flag is a 16-bit uh, field. Uh, field. It's a bitmap to indicate which type 
uh, the uh, I think option can be supported in, uh, in in the device. Next, please. So here, uh, giving the uh, OSPF protocol and uh, if this uh, protocol and the BGPLs, uh, we extend this uh, pro protocol to support uh, the signaling uh, node uh, capability. And, uh, and we, we define the, the format of this ICH node capability uh, extension. Uh, uh, TLA and the sub TLA. Next, please. Okay, uh, this is all the content uh, I present uh, uh, here, and uh, comments are welcome, and we'll find this document uh, further. Thank you. A question at the mic from Rakesh, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, so this is Rakesh. Um, one question I have is that um, I understand the requirement for the NCAP and DCAP node uh, to know the capability uh, because NCAP can add and DCAP doesn't understand, then we have a problem. But it's not clear to me at the intermediate nodes um, because the way I understand IO, OAM data fields are um, if intermediate nodes uh, do not uh, support or understand, they can just um, ignore um, and they don't need to process it. So um, uh, what is the use case uh, for all the intermediate nodes? Yali, did you understand Rakesh's question? Uh, actually, we 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 also considering the intermediate uh, node uh, whether it supports the I uh, think capability. So we we define the I mean I uh, we extend extend the IGP uh, protocol to uh, signaling the intermediate. Uh, I mean the transmit node. Uh, whether it supports the uh, asset option type. Uh, hello, Rakesh. Hello, can you hear? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, this is Robbie. Uh, in fact, for the intermediate uh, node, because you know that the the IOM. Because you know that the it will use if we use the IPv6, uh, the IOM option will be encapsulated in the hop by hop, uh, hop by hop extension header. Now you know the existing the existing uh, some of the implementation of the routers. Uh, it will uh, it will uh, uh, see the if it see the uh, hop by hop uh, uh, header, it will uh, will send this uh, packet to the CPU. I mean, so that's not processed by the hardware. It will send it to the uh, to the line card to process by the CPU. So this will cause the failure. Will cause this the cause this the performance uh, performance uh, reduction of the forwarding. So in order to avoid this uh, this error cases, so it's also need uh, also need the uh, node capability uh, expert uh, for the intermediate nodes. If it cannot support this one, so that's uh, the the path. If it goes through this the goes through this node, so the I fit uh, capability uh, I fit. Uh, uh, detection will not uh, be uh, enabled. Yeah, so that's the that's the case. 
So th there are two things. Uh, one thing is about the capability and other thing uh, is about enabling this function and disabling this function. So, um, uh, no, uh, I mean, so that's the capability is exported by the nodes, uh, by the ingress node and the intermediate nodes. But when you, uh, when you enable this, uh, enable this, the IFIT detection, uh, this will be uh, uh, for a specific SR pass or specific uh, uh, for a specific route. Uh, this being done by the BGP flow spec or the BGP SR policy. Uh, that has been uh, explained by JCP. That's the previous uh, presentation. Okay, thanks, Robin. Any other comments or questions on this one? Otherwise, we'll move on to the final one. Okay, Yali, please go ahead with the final presentation. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the the last uh, talk I think is about the BGP flow spec extension in AVO IP. So next please. So uh, as I present uh, in previous uh, talk, um, uh, just a family of unprecedented techniques emerged. And in current uh, deployment, there have been relatively stacked methods, such as uh, comment line and the net comp, with young model to consider uh, the specific flow or path uh, to be monitored uh, using the IFIT application. So, however, uh, with the evolution of intent space and autonomous uh, network operation, uh, uh, the future data plan can actually will support an on-demand and the reflection loop fashion. So uh, we think, considering the flexibility and the extensibility of metric data acquisition, uh, uh, it means that we, we need the automation to enable different hybrid option types and we, we consider it uh, useful for application aware network operations to to, uh, to enable desired uh, IFIT option type to the, 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 the uh, target flow. Uh, so um, we, we, we uh, quote the uh, the the dis uh, dissemi uh, dissemination of flow specific specification roles and the extent, uh, extension uh, to BGP flow step to the IPSEX data package. Mm, we, uh, in this uh, document, we, we define, uh, define the uh, BGP extended uh, community to enable the IP uh, 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 functionalities. Next, uh, please. Next, uh, please. So uh, here, uh, in this document, uh, BGP spec, uh, we think the BGP spec uh, mechanism uh, supports autom automatic distribution of traffic uh, policies. And uh, so uh, based on the BGP flow spec me uh, mechanism, we just and the the BGP extended community for the IFIX action uh, in this document. Uh, so uh, based on the extended community, uh, uh, the, the routing system can be uh, instructed to add the IFIX option types in uh, into package of flows that match the flow specific specifications and update rele uh, relevant I think, uh, data field in the package that travels. So uh, that's on this motivation uh, in this document, uh, we, uh, 
we, we find uh, a type and the subtypes for the ICT action specific extended community in according uh, with the five different uh, ICT uh, option type. Uh, here we, uh, we leave. Next, please. So uh, this is the uh, first uh, option, uh, option types. It's about IOM pre-allocated and the incremental increased option uh, subtype. Uh, so based on the format of the BGP extended community, we, uh, we, uh, we define the value field uh, concepts concepts of the namesake space ID, uh, flags, IOM trees types. Uh, this uh, data field uh, has the same definition in, in the previous uh, drafts. I mean, the IOM data draft. Uh, yeah. uh, next, please. And the second one is uh, extension for the IOM uh, DX uh, option subtype. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, uh, extend the value field uh, consists of the namespace ID, IOM trace type, and flag. Next, please. Next, please. And the third one is the IOM age uh, to age option subtype. Uh, this one uh, also considering the same. Uh, data field, uh, names with space ID, IOM to end type. Next, please. And uh, the final one is the enhanced alternative marking option subtype. Uh, uh, also, we, we send the data field below uh, monitoring ID, uh, pure road data field. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, okay, that is all the content in this uh, draft uh, comment. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Great. Thanks, and thanks everyone for your patience while we fought with audio issues. Um, any questions or comments on this one? I'm not in the queue, but I have a quick one. This is AC. Go. I can sort of see the community, you know, if you buy off on everything else with flow spec and using the community to turn this on and off these, these OEM options. But I don't see why you want the packet, why you'd want this in the flow spec specification. To try to prevent uh, in situ attack, attack using in situ OAM. Um, Would you like to respond to that, Yelly, or shall we just note it um, for you to respond on the list? Okay, uh, I will respond in, in the email list. Okay, great. Um, and there's another question from Jeff Haas. Hi, I might be addressing AC's comment. I think there are two use cases here. The first use case is that a flow spec injected route, you may want to get uh, the in-situ OEM information. Uh, think about it sort of like triggered you know, uh, NetFlow or IP fix as an example. So this is a way to potentially allow for like a flow spec DDoS mitigation to provide telemetry that could be used to help with the DDoS itself. So that's that's one use case. The second and use that's case. The community, that's the community. Let's let's make sure we agree. And that and the community provides that, right? Yes, but I was going into the second use case, which I have not read the draft, so I don't know if this is covered or as well. But 
if you're looking strictly to get uh, you know, this type of OAM information for specific flows, we basically have, at least as far as I'm familiar with, two technologies in IETF that are sort of flow spec related, you know, one being flow spec itself, the other one is the PSEP extensions that they put in that allow things to be, uh, flows to be addressed in uh, PSEP as well. In those cases, being able to inject state into a router that says, for a flow that matches these properties, I would like to be able to get uh, OAM information. That's a potentially useful property as well. I think it may have interesting scaling problems and somewhat like what I addressed to the uh, people working on the PSEP flow spec uh, feature. If there are situations where rather going for a fully general PSEP extension where you can address everything and you're just looking to address certain types of you know, flow tuples that are common for forwarding hardware. Easy example being like, I want to match a TCP flow that happens to be using this source port desk port to this uh, source address, desk address. You know, these are things that flow caches on uh, forwarding chips already do for things like NetFlow means that you could also trigger the same thing to do uh, for uh, this type of OAM. But I think that would probably need to be in a different address family and potentially with different considerations. Um, yeah, th th thank you for your comment. I'm done with mine. Okay, I think I heard somebody else starting to speak. Uh, this is Robin. Uh, so I think that's the Jeff's the clarification uh, is almost uh, the point uh, to uh, for the for the ACS the question. I think that's uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, this session, the presentation for the I fit there. Uh, there are different granularity uh, for the detection. I think this uh, this uh, presentation is for the. Uh, flow spec based route. I mean, so that's uh, this is just uh, is the five tubes level, and also the previous the presentation is the JCIPS presentation is based on the SR pass level. I mean, so that's the that is the uh, you can see is the aggregation levels the IOM detection. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else? Going once, going twice, we have reached the end of our scheduled time. And um, I'll remind everybody that we have a second session scheduled uh, next week, Wednesday, that's uh, April 8. Um, hope to see you all there, virtually speaking. And um, thanks so much, everybody, for hanging in there and making it a productive meeting. Okay, bye everybody. Just have to figure bye. out what to click on to end this meeting now. Here we go. Bye. Bye bye. 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 And did you get the